got, we're in for a real <laughs> treat. Um, Dr. Hal Bass, uh, Professor Emeritus of Social Sciences, um, taught at Washita Baptist University for 40 years and retired in 2016. Um, he also has been the chair of the Department of Political Science and he does hold uh, degrees from uh, Baylor University and Vanderbilt University as well. Uh, he's also the founding dean of the W.H. Sutton School of Social Sciences, um, and uh, he has also uh, received numerous awards, including the Student Senate Outstanding Faculty Men Member Award and the Washita Purple and Gold Heart Award for Outstanding Service to the University. And he also is Anne's absolute favorite professor at Washita Baptist University. She's, she's told me so many wonderful things. And um, I, we are just really so glad and honored and, and excited about having you join us tonight, Dr. Bass. And uh, so I'm gonna turn that over every, it all over to you. And thank you so, so much for your willingness to share um, uh, about the Constitution with us this evening. So Dr. Bass, thank you again. Thank you. Um, it's my privilege to be here with you tonight, and I really do appreciate the opportunity afforded me by the folks at the uh, Arkansas Humanities Council, and it's great to get back uh, in touch with Ann, one of my favorite students over the uh, decades. I see where another former student, Mary Alice Chambers, is in on the on the meeting tonight, so it's nice to nice to get back in touch. It really, really is. I want to thank all of you all for the roles you play in civic education. Uh, the data is clear. Uh, folks at the elementary and secondary level have a key role in acquainting citizens with civic information, civic norms civic responsibilities. By the time they come to me in college, the uh, cake's been baked. It's, it's, it's your opportunity to take the lead in bringing information to them. And I appreciate the work you all do. I genuinely do. It's a, it's a weighty responsibility. And I'm glad you all have risen to the, to the challenge. And we're gonna talk tonight as, uh, Damon indicated about the constitution itself. We're gonna focus primarily on the text of the first three articles, but I wanna speak for just a little bit about the ratification process by which it got established as the governing document. Uh, I know you all have had a previous session dealing with the, the convention that framed it, but let's talk for just a minute about ratification and then move on to the, to the document itself. The process for ratification is set out in Article 7. Now, my understanding is that you all have been given uh, access to copies of the, of the text, and we won't be looking at Article 7 much today, but we will uh, outline the process. And that is what the Constitutional Convention attendees decided. Once they came up with a document, a framework for government, knowing they had to sell it to the, to the folks in the various states. They decided on a process of specially called ratifying conventions in the several states. They did not choose to go with state legislatures, which might have been a, a more, uh, I guess, normal approach to finding a state authority here. They call for specially called ratifying conventions. And there was a reason. They didn't think they could get this document approved by the state legislatures. And they were hoping and betting that these specially called meetings would, would give them a better chance of selling their, their product here. And they decided that if nine of the 13 states in these ratifying conventions approved of what they had done, then the new government would go into effect 
replacing the old government, the Articles of Confederation, which had been in operation since the uh, early 1780s um, and de facto since 1776, basically. Now, if you're familiar with the Articles of Confederation, you know there's something kind of dicey about this approach, nine of the uh, 13, because under the rules of the Articles of Confederation, which established the United States, under those rules, any amendments, any changes, any alterations had to receive support from all of the states. And once again, the framers in Philadelphia, those 55 folks you met in a previous uh, session, didn't think they had much chance of getting that through for good reason. One state, Rhode Island, had never sent a delegation to Philadelphia. Uh, another state, North Carolina's delegation, had packed up and gone home. So the, the expectations for unanimity among the states, at least at the start, was uh, not high. And uh, they were going to settle for basically three quarters, nine of the 13. Now, realistically, while all the states were equal in their sovereignty and status, some of the big states mattered more for the politics of ratification. In other words, it's fine and dandy for Delaware to be the first to ratify. And it's okay that Rhode Island didn't ratify until 1790 and the government was well underway. But if states like New York and Massachusetts and Virginia are not on board, then this is a pretty, you know, a chancy, chancy project they're engaged in. So the politics is going to focus on getting those, those key states on, on board. And the basic problem they face is that there is substantial opposition to what they've done. And that's kind of hard for us to understand today because we put the Constitution on a pedestal after 220 some odd years here, 230 some odd years here. Uh, and it's good to remember just how controversial this was at the time. Basically, two sides developed. The supporters of the document, those who were trying to sell it in the states, and the opponents, those who were uh, rejecting it or inclined to, to reject it. The supporters took the initiative. They, they had the advantage of a positive program. While the opponents were saddled with the idea that if we don't accept this, can we live with the status quo, the Articles of Confederation? And that was going to be a tough sell, as you all should remember from your, your previous session, because it was dissatisfaction with the Articles that called for the meeting in Philadelphia in the first place. So let's ask ourselves, who were the Federalists and who were the Anti-Federalists? There were some geographical divisions between them. I'm gonna overgeneralize complex realities here, but the Federalist generally hung out on the coast and what they called back then the tidewater regions, going from the Northeast to the, to the Southeast, all the way down to, to a Georgia here. Uh, as you moved west into the interior, opposition, got strong, again, as a general rule. Uh, now, if you are got your thinking cap on this evening, the coastal areas 
tended to be the most populous. That's where the, the cities were. And the rural areas tended to be on the interior. This current 21st century second decade split between urban and rural America has its roots in the debate over ratification here. Uh, what we see today is a very similar situation to what we were seeing back in 1788 uh, when this ratification controversy was going on. Uh, in terms of economic status or social class, the Federalists tend to be more upper middle class, middle class, and then, you know, gentry. Uh, the the anti-federalists tend to be more the common people, if you will. And while there's more of the common people than there are of the upper, upper classes, the upper classes then and now are gonna participate at higher levels here. And that level of participation was another thing gave the, gave the federalists their uh, advantage. One of the things the Federalists did to support their, their cause was to uh, do a publicity campaign with articles published in newspapers, primarily in Virginia and New York. And we have a record of these today in the Federalist Papers. They, they stand as the best commentary on what the supporters of the Constitution thought they were doing here. And as you read through the Constitution, I would urge you to look as well to the uh, Federalist Papers. Cutting to the chase, we need to move on here. Cutting to the chase, the Federalist won. Uh, ratification went fairly quickly in the sufficient number of nine states, but you still didn't have Virginia or New York. Uh, they came on board in the fall of 1788 and uh, the government got underway in the spring of 1789. Um, what were the anti-federalists, what was their beef with the, with the Constitution? They basically thought it gave the central government too much power and compromised state sovereignty too much. And uh, they thought it was a bridge too far. They were willing to consider modifying the articles to increase the power of the national government. But they argued that the uh, document went too far and uh, didn't sufficiently protect either the liberties of the citizens or the rights of powers of, of the states. Uh, one of their leaders, Patrick Henry, very much objected to calling the labeling the sides Federalists and Anti-Federalists. He thought they should have been called ratifiers and anti-ratifiers, and he called them the anti-rats here. Uh, good guys here, not wanting to uh, ratify this document. But let's move on. And if you've got any questions on this, for heaven's sakes, put it into the uh, chat room and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this. Uh, in about 35 minutes here. Um, let's talk about the Constitution as a concept here. What do we think a Constitution is? Two things. It's a framework. It's a, a skeleton. It's got a coat hanger on which you're going to hang the clothing of governance here. Uh, and it's also, particularly in the spirit in which this constitution was written, and by the way, written constitutions were relatively rare back in 1787. They've become commonplace now. Most uh, of the almost 200 nation states on the world scene do have written constitutions now, but that wasn't the case back in 1787. Uh, a constitution is designed in the spirit of our framers to be a limiting document. In other words, it's to constrain in the frame government and keep government 
coloring within the lines, keep government going, going outside the lines. Uh, so let's look at this document and let's look at how it does these two tasks of constitution writers, framing the government and limiting that government. And the clearest way it limits that government is not in the document as written in Philadelphia. It's added on at the insistence of the Anti-Federalist. One of the ways the Federalists got the Anti-Federalist to come on board and give this a try here was by accepting their criticism that rights were insufficiently protected here and adding a Bill of Rights to the Constitution. Uh, it was a promise. It wasn't a done deal, but good faith carried, carried forward here. And that uh, Bill of Rights did come through the prescribed amending process uh, in 1790, here as the new government got, got underway. All right, when we look at the Constitution, we first see the preamble. And my guess is that at least some of you have actually memorized the preamble in, uh, in the past. It's, it's, uh, it's a one sentence introduction to the Constitution. It really doesn't have any governing authority here. That's going to await Articles 1, 2, and 3 and the other others that go forward from it. But it's, it's designed in this framing sense to say, this is what we're trying to do here. And let's look at the preamble under three different headings. Who and why and what? Who is it that's advancing this constitution? It's we the people in the eyes of the framers. They are identifying themselves broadly with the general populace here. We the people, what? Why? What are we trying to do here? And you know, as well as I do, the uh, six uh, reasons they put forward to form a more perfect union, to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense promote the general welfare and to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. I want you to remember those as we go through articles one, two, and three, and we talk about the powers of government authorized in the Constitution. And I want you to think about how they track these expectations put forth by the uh, framers in the preamble. All right, we know who, we the people, we know why, what. The way the preamble ends, to ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Now, I want you to, to think about what they're saying here at the start of the constitution in light of how they end the constitution. What we see in the preamble is an argument. We, the people, do ordain and establish this constitution. Fair enough. But I would ask you, if you've got access to your constitution there, to look over in Article 7 in the second paragraph, where it says, done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present. You see the tension there? Who's establishing this constitution? Is it a we the people entity? Or is it a we the states entity? And the answer is yes. Uh, it, is, it is both here. But that tension is going to be a part of the conflicts that are gonna arise uh, particularly in the uh, first half of the 19th century, 
uh, leading up to up to the Civil War. Now, again, if there are any questions about uh, this preamble, uh, I'll be glad to address them at the at the end, unless I need to, to deal with them immediately. Otherwise, let's turn our attention to what was my main assignment as laid out to me in my discussions uh, in preparing for this. And that is, what do we find in Articles 1, 2, and 3 of the Constitution? We find three articles that deal with a fundamental principle that the Constitution writers, the framers, embraced. And that was the principle of separation of powers. We're gonna see them lay out the notion that governmental power can and should be divided into three broad compartments or containers. They're gonna talk in Article One about legislative power. They're gonna talk in Article Two about executive power. And they're gonna talk in Article Three about judicial power. And they are going to, in a skeletal sense, hang these governmental powers. In each case, primarily, but not exclusively, on a single institution. They're gonna talk about a legislature in the discussion of legislative power. They're gonna talk about an executive in the context of executive power. And they're gonna talk about a court system in the context of judicial power. And as they engage in this activity, they're going to alter and they're going to compromise this founding notion of separation of powers. Now let's ask ourselves the question, why would you want to separate powers? And the easy answer that the framers embraced was because you don't want any one power source to get out of control. You want to let these powers check and balance each other. We put separation of powers and checks and balances together in our discussion so, so routinely, so, so easily that we often are not sufficiently aware that the two ideas are, are really in conflict with each other. We're gonna to go to the time and trouble of separating out power to these three institutions, the executive, legislative, and judicial. And then we're going to blur those lines we just drew by giving each structure, each branch of government a significant role to play in the domain of the others here. So when you combine checks and balances with separation of powers, what you really get is something different from either one. You get what, what we call separated institutions sharing powers. And you'll see how this weaving goes on as we walk through the uh, three articles that we're gonna talk about tonight. But again, be, be aware of just how attentive the framers are to make sure that legislative power is not exclusively the domain of the legislature. That executive power is not exclusively the domain of the executive and the same for, for judicial power and be attentive to when, where, and how these, if you will, intrusions, these checks and balances uh, appear in the document. Okay, let's start then with Article One, the first article, and by far 
the longest article in the Constitution. It has the most what you might call specificity. It has the most what you might call detail, far and away. There's, there's nothing close in the remaining six, six articles here. It's going to consist of 10 sections. There's 10, if you will, units within Article 1. And they're going to start off by vesting legislative power in a bicameral Congress. Bicameral means, of course, two chambers. And if you'll recall from your discussion of the Constitutional Convention, that issue of the foundations for representation in the legislature was the single biggest stumbling block that the delegates dealt with at the Constitutional Convention. Indeed, oh, three or four weeks into the convention, they were so deadlocked on this question that they almost adjourned and went home in, in uh, recognition of their inability. The questions were, and the sides were, who was going to be represented in the legislature? And think back to the preamble and think back to Article 7. Is the legislature going to represent we the people and thus be have representation based on population? Or is it going to be we the states and have representation based on state equality? Reasonable people differ at the convention. Generally speaking, where you stand depends on where you sit. The big states wanted representation based on population to give them an advantage. The smaller states wanted state equality. And neither side would give. So in the spirit of Solomon, they split the baby and set up a two-chambered legislature with one chamber of the House having seats apportioned among the states according to population, and the other House, the Senate, providing for state equality. There was another stumbling block, though, they had to deal with once they made that baby split uh, determination. And that was how you're going to deal with the enslaved populations in the several states, primarily in the South, almost exclusively, not exclusively, but almost exclusively in the South. And for what it's worth, I know we're dealing in an age where this critical race theory stuff has become very, very controversial and uh, contentious. I think it's important to note that the Constitution does not mention the word slavery, but on several occasions, the Constitution does address the institution of slavery, and the Constitution does accommodate the institution of slavery. And in the most, uh, I think you could say, notorious is this issue of representation. Because what the states in the South wanted was the enslaved population to count for purposes of representation. And what the states in the North argued was that since those enslaved people did not have civil rights and civil liberties, they should not be counted for purposes of, of representation. And again, they split the baby with what we came to call the three-fifths compromise here, which lasted until the 13th Amendment and the abolition of slavery, which by definition was sufficient to uh, get rid of the, the 14th Amendment, to get rid of that three-fifths compromise. But once we've 
established a bicameral legislature, we've got to ask the question, how are we gonna choose the members? And they're gonna go with popular election for the House, and they're gonna go with state legislature election for the Senate. And once again, subsequent constitutional amendment has changed the latter. And since the 17th Amendment in 1913, we have popular election for both chambers. But the original constitution reflecting this notion that states are the entities making up the constitutional order is gonna give state organs, state, state institutions, the legislature, a direct role to play in staffing one chamber of the national legislature. They're gonna establish terms. They're gonna establish different terms. Two years for the House and six years for the Senate. And they're gonna stagger the senatorial terms where roughly one third of the body is gonna be elected in any two year, two year cycle. Now, when we come to the presidency in uh, Article Two in a minute, we're gonna see another uh, iteration of this staggering of elections I wanna talk about. They talk about eligibility requirements and they pertain to age, 25 for the House and 30 for the Senate. They refer to citizenship status, seven years a citizen in the House and nine in the Senate. And they refer to residents. And in each case on residents, you've gotta be an inhabitant of the state in which you're elected. Now, if you're paying attention, you might have a question here. Could you, under the Constitution, not live, not reside in the district that you represented in the National Legislature of the House of Representatives? And as far as the Constitution is concerned, sure. Now, whether you get elected is another question. But uh, should you be elected, there's no constitutional bar on this. Uh, if you live in, I'm in the uh, fourth district over here in Hot Springs, but a Hot Springs resident could be elected in the second district in Little Rock with no constitutional uh, issues. And beyond that, inhabitants a pretty, pretty vague term. Uh, establishing residence is pretty easy to do. And there are no residence length requirements mandated in the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution in Article I identifies a couple of leadership positions in the chambers, identifies a speaker, but doesn't specify the speaker has to be a member of the body. So far, yeah, uh, someone said Hillary in New York would be a, a good example of that. Uh, Bobby Kennedy in New York would have been an even better example. When Bobby Kennedy ran in 1964 in New York, he used his sister's house as his mailing address there. Uh, he hadn't lived in New York since he was a kid there. Um, exactly. Okay. Um, Chamber officer is the Speaker of the House. And then there's a President of the Senate who is in fact the Vice President of the United States. We'll talk about the Vice President a little more in the executive article, but the Vice President is first mentioned in the legislative article as President of the Senate. And this is one of those overlaps that you see interspersed among the Constitution. The Senate's also authorized by the Constitution to identify or select, designate a president pro tem who will serve as the presiding officer when the Senate is not being presided over by the, by the vice president. Uh, the next section of the Constitution talks about procedures for enactment of legislation. And you all, I saw a reference earlier to Schoolhouse Rock. 
here. You guys know the basic outline, how a bill becomes a law. Uh, and the Constitution lays out the broad parameters for that. The key features being the law has to be passed in identical form in each chamber and presented to the president who has a law making, a legislative opportunity to uh, veto this law, which if it's gonna go forward is gonna need a super majority in each chamber to be passed over the president's uh, veto. Uh, but again, we see a departure from the idea of separation of powers. We're sharing the legislative power by giving this role to, to the uh, president. Now, powers themselves are the subject of the most extensive set of details in Article One, and that's in Section Eight. And I want to go back to the first sentence in Article One, where it says all legislative power herein granted. The reason I'm doing that is that when we get to Article Two and Article Three, executive power and judicial power, those words herein granted aren't mentioned. And I want us to think about the significance of the inclusion of those words in the legislative order and the uh, omission of those words in the next two, <clears throat> the next two articles here. And I want you all to think about how we should interpret that inclusion and omission. But if you look at what's all right, I don't see the whole question. This is a question from Lisa. Help me out here. And what I'm getting, has there ever been a vetoed bill? What's the rest of the question? Has there ever been a vetoed bill that was sent back to Congress and passed into law by overriding the veto in your lifetime? Yeah, but I can't tell you exactly what it would have been. There have been veto overrides in my life. Veto overrides have become less uh, common. Tell you what, if um, I'll look that up and I'll send an email to Ann and she's got y'all's list and she can give you the answer. But it, it's- No, I was born in the seventies and I haven't ever had one in my lifetime. Well, I'll, I'll check into that and I'll, I'll, I'll send you, I'll let you know the last time there was a veto and I'll get that to Ann and she can, she can tell me, let me make a note right here so I can get that. Thank you for the good question. Okay, um, take that off now. I want you as, you as you think about what what Congress can pass laws pertaining to. That's what's identified in Article One, Section Eight. And I would ask you to consider. And we're not have time to go through this. Consider how they track with those ideals established in the preamble. They, they generally pertain to those kinds of topics. But the larger point here is the framers sold the idea that this constitution was a government of enumerated powers. And the powers the government have, has are those that are listed in the constitution. And that's what makes the absence of herein granted so critical for the executive and the judicial articles. Further, at the very end of Article 1, Section 8, they include what's arguably the most expansive of the legislative powers, and that's what's called the Elastic Clause, or the Necessary and Proper Clause, which says, basically, here's a list of what we can do, and then we can do anything necessary and proper to complement those previous preceding uh, powers. And a liberal or broad interpretation of the elastic clause has indeed pertained over the uh, 230 some odd years now. 
Now the Constitution also in Article One contains some prohibitions imposed on Congress, if you will, some no-nos. Uh, the uh, spirit that leads to the Bill of Rights, which begins, Congress shall make no law in the First Amendment, is present in Article One, Section 9 here, in these prohibitions on what Congress can't do. Um, and then there's going to be also some impositions, prohibitions imposed on the state here, uh, things the states can't do in the system. And I've talked too long here on Article 1. I'm going to move real quick to Article 2 and come back on questions in, in a few minutes here, but I don't want to ignore uh, the rest of the, the articles. Article 2, the executive article, is a much shorter article. It only has four sections as opposed to the 10 in Article 1. And for what it's worth, jumping ahead, Article 3 just has three sections to it. I want you to think for just a minute about why the legislative article is so comparatively long and the other two are so comparatively short. And I want to suggest to you, it has something to do with two things. The framers intended Congress to be the first branch of government and the most vital, the most important branch of government. Whether that's proved to be the case is at best debatable, is probably just wrong. But nonetheless, that was the expectation of the framers. The executive has made great incursions on legislative power over the uh, centuries now. And um, as we shall see, the court has its own uh, high cards to play in this, in this battle among the uh, branches. But the other reason was that the framers knew something about legislatures. They were familiar with legislatures. Many of them had been legislators at the state and a handful at the national level. Remember the articles, the old government did not have a direct provision for their executive or judicial authority. They were, they were flying blind on the executive side. They knew what they didn't want, and that was tyranny. But they weren't sure what they did want. And it shows in the relative vagueness of Articles 2 and 3 compared to Article, Article 1 here. All right, so what do we have in Article 1? We have a vesting of executive power in a president. And note two things. There's no hearing granted. In other words, there's no limitation specified on executive power uh, there. Uh, and that's going to be a license, if you will, kind of like an elastic clause to, to, move, to move forward for the executive. But secondly, it's going to put executive power is going to vest executive power in a single person, a president. There was actually quite a bit of support at the convention for a dual or a plural president. And of course, they knew in Britain, the role model, they had a head of state, the monarch, and a head of government, the prime minister. They deliberately opted for a single executive who was the head of state symbol for the, for the country, but not in and of itself the head of government because governmental power shared by the various, by the various branches. Uh, the term of office is four years. Now, what does this mean when we combine it with 
the terms of office in the House and in the Senate. It means in any given election, you're going to have all the members of the House elected. Every federal election, every two years, every member of the House, there's four and 35 now, is up for election. Every seat is up for election. Half the time, there'll be a presidential election. In other words, in a four-year presidential term, there'll be a congressional election midway. And that congressional election will also have roughly one third of the senators up for grabs. What this does is from the framers perspective, limit the capacity of we the people to influence governmental outcomes. We have our shots in the house every two years, but in the executive, indirectly, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, only over four years. And in the Senate, remember, prior to 1917, 1913, 1913, no, no say. Yeah. Okay, uh, how are we going to choose this executive? The sentiment of the convention is we ought to let Congress choose the executive. But there's a pretty intense minority who doesn't want to do that because they think that will give Congress too much power and it'll make the executive beholden to the legislature and not sufficiently able to check legislative power. So what the Congress guys say is, if not Congress, then what? And that's where we get the Electoral College. It has very little support early on, but it, it survives as the only alternative to executive to a legislative selection that there's any, any agreement on. Uh, Mary Alice has a question here. Can we, can we, can you give me that in? Here we go. Okay. Uh, Mary Alice wants to know if term limits were not a part of it, why term limits were not the original document? And was there a history in other sets of governments? Mary Alice, for what it's worth, there was very little popular government available in those days. In Great Britain, the legislature uh, was member in the House of Lords hereditary and in the House of Commons only property landed folks were able to vote. That, that democratization doesn't come to Great Britain until the 1830s or so. Uh, and so the fact of the matter is uh, popular elections are simply a, a fairly new idea on the national level here. It's, um, and there, I don't recall any discussion of term limits on the legislative side. Now on the executive side, since they are coming with a new, new entity, there is initially a commitment to a one year, excuse me, a one term, seven year presidency. But that gets pushed aside by the convention and they go with a uh, four year term with no mention of provision for or prohibition of reelection. And then of course, after the two term tradition is broken by Franklin Roosevelt, we get the 22nd Amendment in the early 50s, which does provide term limits. But uh, while it was discussed for the executive, it wasn't discussed that I'm aware of for the, uh, for the legislature. Um, eligibility requirements are somewhat parallel to the uh, legislative ones with a little bit more seniority. They are uh, citizenship 
a little stricter here. You gotta be a natural born citizen, whatever that means. And it's an imprecise term or a citizen at the time of the adoption of the constitution here. Uh, you've got to be 14 years a resident of the United States, not any particular state. And you've got to be 35 years of age. But you can see how this kind of parallels the legislative uh, requirements here. There's a provision for filling a vacancy. We have a vice president who is there basically in the, in the eyes of the constitution to preside over the Senate and to succeed in the event of a vacancy in the presidential office. There's no other specifications for the role and status of the vice president. There is no provision in the original constitution for filling a vacancy in the vice presidency. That's gonna to have to wait till the 25th amendment to come along. Uh, and we do have such a provision now. But until then, we had about as many vacancies in the vice presidency as we had in the presidency before the mid 1960s here. Uh, and we all know that when the vice president succeeded the presidency, there was a vacancy there. We didn't always pay attention to that there wasn't a vice president there. And when that happens, the Constitution gives to Congress the authority to fill in the line of, line of succession. Uh, the president is provided with an oath of office. Now, the Constitution does mention that we have other, uh, have oaths, oaths can be established for other offices, but it's only stipulated. It's only mentioned for the Constitution. I got a question here, Ann. Help me out. Let me see here. Uh, do you think they would have been 30? Do we think they'd have probably wanted someone older uh, if they did it now? Uh, I really don't know. Uh, 35 was mature in the uh, lifespan of folks back in 1787. Uh, I guess it depends on who would be doing the draft. I don't know. That, that's an interesting question. I really don't know. I'm glad you asked that question. It'd be, uh, it'd be, it'd be interesting to speculate on that. All right, I'm going to real quickly turn. Uh, let, let me just mention two other things. There are some enumerated responsibilities or roles assigned to the president, things like commander in chief here, some specific powers given powers to grant pardons, to make nominations, things like that. And then there's a prohibition for a provision for impeachment and removal. All right, so let's move to the Article 3. And then we'll let you all get your questions in uh, more directly. We're going to have vesting of judicial power in a Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may ordain and establish. In other words, what the judicial branch looks like in the Constitution is a Supreme Court is established, and then Congress, the first branch of government, is authorized to uh, set up lower courts. What Congress is beginning in 1790 have done is fill in those blanks with a three tiered judicial structure. We have at the top, a Supreme Court. At the bottom, we have district courts. We now have 94 of these scattered around the country. Uh, Arkansas, in a typical fashion, has two. <laughs> um, that's you know, fairly normal. Some of the bigger states have, have more, some of the smaller states only have, have one, but, but two is the two is the norm. And then there are 13 in the middle level, courts of appeal. The district courts are trial courts. They hear federal cases and they try them. And then outcomes can be appealed to the uh, appellate courts 
the courts of appeals, and then ultimately to the Supreme Court. Uh, Congress has the authority to establish and limit the jurisdiction of the federal courts beyond the original jurisdiction established by the Constitution. The Constitution does establish for the Supreme Court original jurisdiction where it's the first case, for first court to hear a case. But for what it's worth, these original jurisdiction cases are exceedingly rare. They almost never happen. All the cases the Supreme Court's going to hear this term are going to come to it on appeal here from the lower federal courts here. Uh, and Congress has the authority. If it does not want the court to hear a certain kind of case to limit, the only time the Congress has really gotten serious about exercising this power was after the Civil War, when Congress and the Republicans who were uh, anxious to remake the governmental order in a post-Civil War era didn't want the Supreme Court getting in their way here. And they did put some restrictions on jurisdiction of the court then. Um, one of the things I would note is that the number of courts is purely at the discretion of the Congress and the number of judges, including the Supreme Court, is purely at the discretion of Congress. I think it's noteworthy that there are no eligibility requirements for judges under the Constitution. No age requirement, no education requirement, no citizenship requirement, no residence requirement, nothing. As far as the Constitution is concerned, it's a blank slate as to who can be, who can get a nomination uh, by the president and confirmation by the Senate to be a federal judge. Okay, uh, I've run past the time I said I was going to talk. <laughs> I promise you guys you could have at least 20 minutes to ask additional questions. And uh, I see I've got one right here from Clay, uh, but, but I would just leave you with my prepared remarks with this notion, and I'll, I'll repeat myself. Separation of powers combined with checks and balances gives us a skeleton or structure of federal government with separated institutions sharing the three powers. Now, let me turn to Clay's question here. Uh, question is, uh, what's the purpose of lifetime appointments for the Supreme Court? And I do think as the question indicates here, it is to provide judges with a buffer from what might be called uh, political passions. You, the term you use was influence here, but it's uh, it's like insulation in a house. It's to, to insulate the judicial, the exercise of judicial power from the kind of accountability that comes with elections here or our term limits here. Uh, I don't know that to get back to an earlier question, I don't know that a current constitutional convention would uh, go with lifetime appointments for federal judges, particularly given the, the increases in lifespan that we've experienced over the past 230 30 years. In other words, the idea of someone serving decades on the Supreme Court was probably not a good bet in 1787, but uh, We've got people on the court right now uh, in their 40s who could very easily be serving uh, 40 years from now. Uh, and we've got people on the court now who were initially nominated over 30 years ago. Okay, uh, I've got a question here from, from Lisa. What's the purpose of presidential order according to the constitution? 
Are you referring here to executive orders? Is that the, uh, is that the yes. reference? Okay. An we'll executive call it order. order these days. Yeah, sure. An executive order has the force of law in the absence of a congressional response. But it's a way presidents get things done within the executive branch that that pertain to their what they would claim to be their unitary authorities. In other words, there's a there's a theory about the presidency that flies in the face of what I talked about in terms of their separated institutions sharing powers. And uh, the the simple observation is that there's presidential scholars who argue that the president is relatively unconstrained within the executive branch, within the domain of the executive branch by the other, by the other branches, particularly Congress. I would also mention for you, Lisa, that executive orders in international relations are a way of making arrangements between heads of state that don't require the treaty uh, confirmation of a supermajority in the in the uh, legislature. So a lot of what presidents do in foreign policy, particularly if there's tension with Congress, is to use executive orders for foreign policy uh, actions. Now Anne's asking the question here: Have the articles discussed tonight been altered by constitutional amendment? Yes, they have. Let's let's see if we can. Uh, run through a couple of ways that they have. I mentioned how the 17th Amendment, in fact, changes the uh, election of senators and shifts it from the state legislatures to the people. I mentioned the 25th Amendment, which provides for filling a vacancy in the vice presidency. Uh, let's see if we can think of any others. The Eleventh Amendment is going to article is going to alter judicial power uh, in terms of states' rights a little bit here. Uh, yeah, how the vice president was elected. Uh, presidential term limits, very good. Yeah, you guys are on track. <laughs> now we're seeing something in every case here. Very good. So, so my question was. Of the three, all of them have been altered. Yes. By constitutional article, article one, two, and three. Okay. Look different in today's constitution than they did earlier. Uh, Lisa mentions the uh, Reconstruction Amendments. Get rid of the uh, uh, three-fifths clause. Mm -hmm. the representation here. Uh, very good. All right. Keep keep the questions coming. Uh, we've got I guarantee y'all some time here. And I, I, I went through a lot of stuff quickly here, so we can sure fill in some blanks. We've got one from Clay. Under Article 2, the president having power to pardon seems strange. Why give a single person this power and not a legislative body? Okay. Uh, the idea would be, in theory, uh, that pardoning is a way of remedying some injustice that's been done to a citizen in the federal system here. And that injustice would have been done under the laws and who's primarily responsible for making, making the laws. It is the uh, legislature. Uh, beyond that, and I think a bigger factor has to do with custom and practice. If you look at who was giving pardons in 1787, it was kings. Because generally speaking, legislatures outside of Great Britain really didn't have much independent power in 1787, at least in the Europe that they were you know, familiar with here. And custom and practice said, this is something that executives do. And 
the framers just specified it. Uh, the pardon power has long been controversial, uh, but it's been particularly controversial, you know, in y'all's in y'all's lifetime here. First with Nixon, and then later on with uh, certainly lots of presidents leading office uh, use that pardoning power to to do controversial uh, things. So a couple of follow-ups on the pardon question, and sure. then we've got a couple of other questions. Okay. Patrick says, isn't the power to pardon inherent in the enforcement of laws? And Lisa says, so the pardon might be a check of the judicial branch, question mark. Yeah, judicial branch and the legislative branch. In other words, if some sort of injustice has been, has been done here. If, uh, so yeah, uh, technically speaking, it could be the executive too, because after all, it's the Department of Justice prosecuting someone who does a federal, uh, and that's the president's, president's domain. So I think it's, it's simply somebody has to do it. The president, uh, in the framers' estimation, is in the best position to, to be both merciful and responsible. All right, what was... And then, well, then Patrick just made the comment, isn't the power to pardon inherent in the enforcement of laws, meaning? Well, like, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, certainly once you've got a sentence imposed, you, you can argue there ought to be a check on that, on that sentence here. But whether it's inherent, you need to, you need to stipulate who's going to, Who's going to exercise it here? Well, okay. What y'all decide on that? Uh, what y'all decide on that uh, override of vetoes? I know y'all got some data on that. What's the answer? Oh, there's a bunch. Um, there's only a few presidents who haven't had. Jama found a website that lists veto 1789 to present and only let's see Lyndon Johnson JFK Warren G Harding <laughs> William McKinley we can guess why all those uh James A. Garfield Lincoln well, one term president if you think about yeah, it yeah Buchanan Fillmore Taylor Tyler, oh, there's a bunch early that had no overrides, but but you get the point. I mean, let's see who had the most overrides. Johnson had 15. Johnson wins. Johnson had Roosevelt had the most vetoes. Franklin Roosevelt had the most vetoes. Yeah, but I'm talking about overrides. Yeah, yeah. yeah Johnson had the most overrides. And, and we think of Johnson as a master of the legislature, and yet he has he has the most overrides. Yeah, and then Eisenhower and Ford are tied for second. <laughs> both those had divided government. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting little chart. Well, it really is. And then and then it it get it sends you to another page to find the specifics of the ones that sure. were overridden, but. Yeah, Johnson had 93 vetoes. Well, 93, yeah. Let me, is there, is there another question here forthcoming? I don't want to. Um, yes, there is. Hang on, let me get, let me get back to you. I, I have it. time, I've got some, I want to say that. I found it. It's uh, okay. in regard to the Electoral College uh -huh. and, um, the question is, do you foresee the Electoral College being eliminated in the next 50 years due to some of the recent press and push for its removal? Uh, no, uh, I think the best shot at getting rid of the Electoral College would have been back in the uh, 60s and early 70s when there was the push. And uh, bottom line is the smaller states, well, first place, to get rid of the electoral college will require a constitutional amendment. And that means you've got to get 
three quarters of the state legislatures to coming on board to do it. And I think that's too high a bar to expect given that smaller states feel that the electoral college gives them a say they wouldn't have in what I think framers would do today, and that would be go with direct popular vote. There is a wire around possibility that's brewing. Uh, I don't see it happening, but here's the, here's the concept that uh, is being advanced in, in several states. It's called the National Popular Vote uh, Initiative. And what the, the guys, I use their guys generically here, what, what, what the people who are pursuing this reform are asking the states to do is to enact legislation pledging their designated electors to vote for the winner of the national popular vote. And if, and it's a huge word, if you could get states comprising 270, which is the magic number for electing a president by the Electoral College, to uh, go along with that idea and then actually do it under pressure, mm -hmm. uh, you could conceivably have within the formal framework of the Electoral College, a uh, structure, a system that would give, that would guarantee that the national popular vote winner did, did do it. But you're gonna be asking electors chosen by the people in the states to uh, vote for somebody else. And that's, that's gonna be a dicey proposition here. Uh, they would ask about altering the winner take all. Uh, once again, that is, I, I had to say earlier, the winner take all provision is not constitutional. The winner take all provision is custom and practice and state laws. If you look at the electoral college totals in the early presidential elections, you will see it quite common to have states dividing their totals. They started going with what we call the unit rule, uh, oh, really by the 1820s, by the 1830s, the unit rule was firmly established. It's been compromised in a couple of states in my lifetime, uh, Nebraska and Maine, who have gone with the congressional district system for electing electors instead of a statewide system for electing electors. And in that sense, you could win a congressional district that was out of sync with the rest of the state. And that's what's happened a couple of times in uh, recent years. So yeah, state legislatures have carte blanche to change how the allocation of their electoral votes is uh, uh, determined here. And for what it's worth, you do not have to popularly elect electors under the Constitution. Uh, we all do it right now. But a state legislature would be acting within the Constitution if it opted for an alternative system. And if you'll recall the trauma and the turmoil associated with the previous presidential elections. There was actually some speculation that a couple of states would do something like that. Okay, we've got one, one more question, I think. Austin asks, you mentioned the founders initially viewing the legislative branch as the primary seat of governance over the executive. Right. Roughly, when does the switch happen to where the executive branch becomes the face of American government? Okay, you do have in the 19th century, a couple of presidents. Actually, I've mentioned three, Jefferson, Jackson, and Lincoln, who, who do kind of flex their muscles a little bit and, and crowd out the legislature. But it's really a 20th century phenomenon. It's connected in part to a rising world role for the United States 
So the president's role as chief foreign policy maker and head of state becomes a little more important. It's connected to the rise of mass communication uh, technologies, which make the president a much more visible public figure and enhance the president's what they call bully pulpit capacity. And you see the starting of this with people like Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. And that trend has continued throughout the 20th century with a couple of interruptions. Okay, and Leslie has a great question for uh, you. What gaps do you see the collegiate in the collegiate level regarding these subjects that we need to do a better job of with teaching our history students? Okay. Um, if I could wave a magic wand <laughs> and get an outcome out of civics education at the elementary and secondary levels, I would want you guys to emphasize the value of participation here and instill an ethic, an ethos of, of participation. Uh, what, what worries me far more than the lack of knowledge of facts or historical events, important though I consider them to be, is the sense of detachment, separation from the, the, govern, the governmental process. And uh, if, if, I could, if I could get an outcome that would most satisfy me, kids would come to adulthood excited about the opportunities to participate and taking advantage, not just of voting, but, but uh, working in campaigns and writing letters to the editor, just that, that, that civic engagement, I guess is the way I would, I would promote it. And, 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 and what, you, what you can do to encourage that. It, 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 just, it just seems to me there's so much to be cynical about in today's uh, political environment. I'd like for the younger generation to bring a sense of optimism and excitement to, to their coming of age and being a part of the process. And yeah, it's not just the young people, it's, it's certainly sorely lacking everywhere. Good, good point. But I think if you, if you, get, if you get folks engaged, if, 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 if you look at electoral participation, yeah. uh, the, the, the 20 somethings are the lowest on the, on the age scale until you get truly into geezerhood. <laughs> Any other questions or comments you all have? This is fun for me. I know you all are giving up your, your evening for this and I, I appreciate that very much. It's been a joy to, to reconnect with, with Mary Alice and with, with Ann here and to, to, to meet the rest of you all. Yeah, this is, this is great fun. Um, Ann can give you my, my email. If y'all have questions, follow up or along the way, um, please let me know. And, you know, depending on, you know, where you are and what's going on, if I can ever, you know, you know come by and talk to your kids about the electoral college or something like that, I'd, I welcome the opportunity. That'd be great. Gosh, Dr. Bass, thank you so very much. What, what an amazing presentation. And, and um, you know, you see in, in the chat box where there are so many people that have thoroughly enjoyed your presentation as much as myself. And um, so we really do appreciate it. And I think, this is this is this is what, what I live for is, is chances like like this and, 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 and the excitement you all have and the interest you all have. Uh, keep up the great work. Well, we really appreciate it so much. So, right. so much. I really do th thank you all so very much for uh, joining us tonight. And Dr. Bass, what a great evening. I really kind of hate to see it end. It's just been so <laughs> Formative and so good. And y'all's questions were just exceptional. 
Um, so thank you for all of this. And it has really been a pleasure uh, to spend the evening with you. And again, Dr. Bass, thank you again for everything. We really appreciate it. And thank you all. And I hope we, you all join us in the future uh, and you'll hear more information uh, on when they're come, you know, they'll be scheduling. Uh, but we've got a lot of great, great presentations um, that are lined up uh, in the coming weeks. So we hope to see you again then. Please have a wonderful holiday season. And thank you so much for tonight. And you guys have a great night. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Dr. Bass.